Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. For more than 20 years, our parent foundation, the U.S. Space Walk of Fame, has been preserving the birth of America's space age, born right here in Brevard County that I call the delivery room of America's great space age. And 53 years ago, we have one of the most incredible missions of all, Apollo 8, launched from just nine miles away from where I'm sitting talking to you today. And it definitely didn't put the nail in the coffin, but it put the lid on the coffin of Russia's attempts to go to the moon because the mission of Apollo 8 and all three astronauts are still alive. We'll talk about them in a minute. Definitely won the moon race for America. And as Time Magazine celebrated this mission in January, they say it saved 1968 in America where we had two assassinations, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy and all kinds of civil unrest going on in our country. And then out of those, those problems comes the orbiting the moon for the first time on Christmas Eve, 1968. And we're gonna talk about that from the perspective of two of our, who I call national treasures of our museum. One who's passed away, Scott McLeod, and the other one, John Kioma, who I talked to today about his role in Apollo 8. Both had very interesting uh, uh, stories to tell, and we're going to share them with you here on Stay Curious. But let's crank up today with thinking about the winter solstice today. Hey, the first day of winter everywhere, which though January and February are pretty rough, one thing that we get more sunlight after today than we do uh because today is the longest night of the year, which astronomers like, and the shortest daylight of the year today. So hope you're out enjoying a good winter solstice wherever you are. And I wanted to remind you all of our good friends up in Fairbanks, Alaska, a photograph taken many years ago of the sunrise and sunset in Fairbanks, Alaska, our American state way up there, the largest state. Uh, where they have today, sunrise was at 10.52 a.m. Talk about sleeping in. And sunset was at 2.45 p.m. So they had under four hours of daylight today in Fairbanks, Alaska. Three hours and 53 minutes to be a fact. Not to be a fact. But, you know, 20 hours of darkness, a stargazer like me loves that. All right, because you can see all kinds of things uh, uh, if you want to stay up that late or uh, whatever. So... Everywhere in the world is different uh, uh, because of the tilt of the Earth's axis is why we have the reasons for the seasons. And don't remember, or don't forget, don't down, uh, yeah, don't remember, don't forget that down in Australia and Southern Africa and Southern South America, it is the first day of summertime down there in beach weather. But we're always lucky because it's usually beach weather here on the Space Coast uh, where these amazing things have happened in America's space program that our country is so proud of, and none could be more fabulous than the Apollo 8 journey. And here is our little Christmas ornament. Boy, I'd like to have this Christmas ornament, not the photograph of it. That's old school, as I think of old school, thinking of Marty Winkle, my good friend there. How you doing, Marty? Co-producing and behind the scenes here. And Jessica Galloway, she's got the headset on for the microphone and uh, running the board today as uh, they're switching back and forth as we've learned a new new way to give you this wonderful program. It's called Stay Curious. And please tell your friends to follow us on YouTube, Twitch. Twitch is a gaming platform. And of course, Facebook. And uh, follow us, like us, share us, and subscribe to us because it's important to our nonprofit to reach out. And we feel we're doing pretty good in providing some interesting video podcast content that you don't get anywhere else. And you're not going to hear these stories I'm going to share with you anywhere else but here. Of course, everyone's talking about Apollo 8 today and uh, the historic Apollo 8 mission to orbit the moon on Christmas Eve 1968 was launched on December 21st, 1968, about 8.30 in the morning, I think. And, of course, was commanded by Gemini veteran Frank Borman there on the left and his Gemini 7 crewmate on the right, Jim Lovell. Remember, they spent 14 days together side by side in like uh, uh, if you whatever vehicle you're driving that's got twice as much room as they probably had on the in the front seat for 14 days orbiting earth 
Uh, and then rookie Bill Anders is there in the middle. All three of the crewmen are alive. Bill Anders is 87 years old. He was born in British Hong Kong. Borman, there on the left, was born in Gary, Indiana, and Lovell in Cleveland, Ohio, 93 years ago for both of those guys. Such great friends for, gosh, they've been friends for over 70 years. Imagine that. <clears throat> well, the stories we have to tell today come from one uh, of the Apollo 8 launch, and here is the Apollo 8 Saturn V rocket on the launch pad. I'm pretty sure that's a superimposed moonrise on there, but I'll have to check that. But the one story we have here is from Scott McLeod, a great friend of the museum and personal friend of mine over the last few years. He passed away this year. And Scotty, we miss you a lot. We're happy to hear from your daughter, Heather. Tell, and we tell her that we're keeping your dream alive. Uh, and and uh, uh, Scott's wife, uh, Joyce, also. Uh, you're going to see a picture of her. But Scott McLeod was a former Grumman test astronaut. And he has the story of taking famed aviator Charles Lindbergh to the launch of Apollo 8 on the morning of December 21st. <clears throat> McLeod was the Grumman test astronaut and was on a mock-up moon television set uh, inside the lunar module talking to CBS anchorman Walter Cronkite during the Apollo 9 through 17 missions. And Walter Cronkite, the famed CBS newscaster, would say, Scott, what are they doing now? And he'd say, well, Neil's about to get on his hands and knees and back off onto the platform, onto the, 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 uh, the rungs of the ladder type of thing. And, and Scotty, we love you and miss you. Uh, we've done an oral history with him that we never posted. And he lived to be 94 <clears throat> in the last year or so. He, he declined being on our Stay Curious program. But uh, here he is, and he's actually signing one of his own photographs of him in a uh, Apollo-class spacesuit. And the other gentleman we're going to hear from uh, uh, is uh, uh, from their written words is John Kioma. There on the left, Marty, there you are, looking happy. There's Marty, a friend of John's through the shuttle era, right? Uh, you guys knew each other. John uh, is 85. I talked to him on the phone today, asked his permission to share his story again. He spent 40 years in the aerospace industry, first as an Air Force radi radar technician, and then becoming an electrical tech for Martin Company during Titan, Matador, and Pershing rockets. So he's a real old school rocket engineer guy. He worked on the Gemini program as well as a Saturn rocket and the space shuttle as a contractor for North American Aviation and Rockwell International. So, uh, <clears throat> John was the planner and scheduler of rocket launches and was involved in a series of events that led for him to schedule the launch date of Apollo 8 on December 21st, 1968. And you're going to be a little amazed that NASA had the guts to schedule this flight after the all-up test flight of Apollo 6 that John Kiyoma is going to tell us about here uh, uh, in his written words. So there is the launch of Apollo 6, okay. Uh, and I'll get back to that in a second there. Uh, that's a little out of sequence for me. There is, I wanted to show you the picture of that is Charles Lindbergh on the left with Werner von Braun in 1968. And here is, uh, there's Scott McLeod with his wife, Joyce. All right, let me get you Scotty's story here. Uh, and we hope Joyce is doing well. Uh, we miss her also. And these are some of the items that Scott put in our auction several years ago. Uh, Marty and I raveled over that. What you're looking at on the left foreground is the Saturn V rocket first stage with a Grumman space shuttle on it, a concept that Grumman had. I believe we sold that model for over $2,000 at an auction. And then Scott McLeod's personal Grumman lunar module, supersized. Marty's got a lunar module, but it's about a third of that size, isn't it, Marty? He had a, a big one there for a, a while, and that was autographed by him. And uh, that went for several thousand dollars. So I uh, wanted to share that story here from Scott in his own words. Quote, I was a test astronaut for Grumman Corp. in Bethpage, Long Island, New York, and trained the Apollo astronauts on flying the lunar module we built. So I got to know all the astronauts very well on their visits. My wife, Joyce, is an expert scuba diver, and she was trained by David Lindbergh, Charles's son. 
the famous aviator. So we also became friends. And in fact, Joyce held the deep sea diving record for a woman for many, many years. Joyce and I were invited to the launch of Apollo 8, and I got a call from Charles Lindbergh asking if I could get him a ticket to the launch. I said certainly he could get his own ticket as NASA would want him there as a VIP. And Lovell and Borman talked about him being their hero, Charles Lindbergh. Now, there is a story reported that Lindbergh was on a sand dune three miles away from the launch site with Marilyn Lovell, wife of Apollo 8 astronaut Jim Lovell. When McLeod said without, uh, without hesitation, Lindbergh stood beside me and my wife in the VIP stance. He said Charles wanted to go incognito, and uh, he didn't want the attention, and he was like that, of course, after the, the big trauma of the Lindbergh baby being kidnapped and so forth. Uh, part of history you all need to read up on. So Scotty told Charles Lindbergh, no problem, we'll sneak you in. So I requested an extra ticket, and Charles, under a, a hat and, and trench coat, stood between Joyce and myself as we watched the Saturn V roar away on that beautiful morning. So what a story from Scott McLeod and his wife, Joyce. And, and uh, Heather, we hope you enjoy uh, hearing that story about your wonderful dad. Now John Kioma here has a very interesting story and uh the saturn five uh and here's john's story quote i was the lead scheduler for the s2 second stage of saturn five in 1968. the first saturn five mission to earth orbit was unmanned it was the unmanned apollo 4 which was called as 501 apollo saturn 501 launched on november 9th 1967 and it was a success before I go for, further, Trekkie Techie Jessica is going to post John's conversation with us on Stay Curious on October 27th, 2020, uh, a year ago. We had a great conversation with him in front of this model. So check that out. And John does tell this story in our conversation on Stay Curious over a year ago. John continues, it was determined that one of the second stage S2 engines suffered a small break. Oh. So let's back up here. Uh, Apollo 4, AS501, November 1967, was a success. The second Saturn V launch, unmanned Apollo 6, mission AS502, had some problems. Now, this had a dummy uh, lunar module on it, but it had a command module with a reentry uh, shield that they wanted to test. Launched on April 4th, 1968, two of the J5. Two of the five J-2 engines on the second stage, the S-2, shut down early. And the J-2 engine on the third stage failed. Most of the mission objectives were met, but the engine problems had to be solved. It was determined one of the second stage S-2 engines suffered a break in a small cryogenic line, resulting in a shutdown signal being sent to that engine. But due to a wiring area, wiring error, the signal went to the wrong engine, resulting in the loss of two engines. <clears throat> During pre-launch checkout of the engines, when the shutdown signal was sent, it was not confirmed which engine received the signal. That was a big, big faux pas. <clears throat> well, an investigation found that the J-2 engine, when fired at sea level, had thick ice on the line, of course, from the 300 below zero fuel, hydrogen fuel, and this dampened the vibrations going up as, as it accelerated. But in space, 40 miles high or so, the lack of ice caused the line to break. It was actually actually an insulation of the, the uh, jittering back and forth of the launch. A J-2 engine test firing was conducted in Tullahoma, Tennessee, vacuum chamber confirming the problem. Despite the problem of the engines, the next flight was to be manned into the moon. Now, John, <clears throat> talking to him today, said, um, you know, think about that. Um, in today's risk avoidance world, we would not be, uh, we, they would not have taken the second stage and uh, had these problems and then put a crew on it. They probably would have done another test of this without. But we were in a moon race with the Soviet Union, all right? 
And uh, he said, I doubt 50 years later that a rocket company would okay a manned flight right after the problems of the previous launch. But in May 1968, NASA conducted a meeting of the possibility of a manned flight around the moon before the end of the year. Uh, Robert uh, Mueller was a, a, a NASA VIP that really promoted that. Uh, and North America's director, Al Martin, was asked about the J-2 engine issues, and he told NASA he was confident the problem was solved. So John Kioma says, I scheduled my rocket, second stage, would be ready for the December 21st launch date, and everything went smoothly. So again, imagine that you had a few hiccups on two of the main uh, uh, two stages of three. <clears throat> they did achieve all goals on the flight of Apollo 6, including the reentry of the command module and testing the heat shield. So the third flight of an all-up Saturn V rocket was AS-503, was the manned Apollo 8 in an Earth orbit test of the command module and some of the lunar module hardware, basically how how the dummy was going to ride to space. Uh, but the lunar module wasn't ready completely, uh, so they discussed this was go Apollo 8 was going to be Earth orbit, and they discussed because the rumor was Russia was ready to go to the moon as early as January 1969, which was actually false. They had a lot of problems that they hid. So uh, there we have it, the history of the, of the, the launch on the, the second Apollo 8 was a success orbiting the moon for the first manned flight of the Saturn V after the failures of AS-502. And John said it shows the problems that problem solving and the daring decisions being made to win the moon race over the Soviet Union. And we did it. Not necessarily cutting corners, as I'm sure Marty, who was working on that lunar module at the time, would say, but they had the assurance with the data that everything was okay to fly the, sec the third all-up Saturn V to the moon. And we did it, launched today in space history. And uh, John, thank you for that story, and it was very nice talking to you today. He's a and Jessica has put up the links to John's really incredible Stay Curious conversation over a year ago. From the before time. And, uh, yeah, is, uh, Jessica said it's before her time, so it's Marty and me winging it in our old school way. But uh, we had this nice setup behind John, and it was a great conversation. And once again, I enjoy talking to all of our national treasurers. I keep up with some of them quite on a regular basis. Uh, that is a privilege that I do here as the liaison of the, of, for the community here at the American Space Museum. Well, what we got, there is the launch of, uh, uh, that is Apollo uh, 6 there, uh, being launched there. Uh, kind of a beautiful scene there in the, the mission that set the stage for Apollo 8. And here are those gentlemen taking a Time magazine at the 50th anniversary. They got these three gentlemen together. Uh, three years ago, I guess that had been about 90 years old for Borman and Lovell, and and uh, there's uh, Anders. Anders took that famous picture of the moonrise, and I posted already to play at about 7 o'clock at night on Christmas Eve the transmission of Apollo 8 off of YouTube when they read from the book, uh, the Bible, the first 10 chapters of Genesis, which they chose because they felt like those 10 chapters applied to all spiritual religions and thoughts on earth. It was not a Christian biblical choice. And with that, we wanted to say, join us tomorrow when we're going to talk about some astronauts in space during Christmas time. And on Thursday, we've got a special taped presentation with a gentleman named Yves Plando, a Frenchman who put down over $200,000 in his ticket number 248 on Virgin Galactic's ride to suborbital space. So we've got that uh, racked up, ready to roll on Thursday. And Friday, Christmas Eve, we won't have a live program. We might put something from one of our previous shows on there for your enjoyment. So... What a pleasure it has been to bring you Stay Curious this year. Yes, Jessica. Go find a playlist and, and you 
know, watch it while you're opening presents. <clears throat> right. Go find our playlist on YouTube. Crank it open to uh, uh, American Space Museum and let it roll so we can build up our viewing hours and monetize our YouTube channel. And up for those last minute gifts or that money that you get after Christmas, remember Amazon Smile. Smile. Is is you connect it to our nonprofit and anything you buy uh, on Amazon Smile goes a little piece of it goes to our your favorite nonprofit, the American Space Museum. Well, thank you, Jessica and Marty. We'll be back with our last live program, uh, not of the year. We'll be with you in between the holidays, but we wish a happy holiday to everybody out there. Stay safe as you're traveling. And until tomorrow, it's Mark Marquette saying, see you again to bridge the space between us.